from the Stratton River Works and the association. This is such an exciting little prairie. And the Italy Prairie Network's going to do a visit up there, are they not? That's correct. Yeah. All right. Where's the. Oh, well, here we danger. go. Okay. And are you able to hold the microphone too? Or? I'm really loud. Okay. Okay. I okay. think. Does that sound good? Okay. My wife always tells me I talk too loud. <laughs> it comes, I think, from lecturing, I suppose. Uh, very nice job there, Taylor. I guess my question to you is how did you get through Drake without taking a class from me? Was that on purpose? You don't have to say. <laughs> All right. So, how many of you have been to Tipton Prairie? Oh, right. Really good number. That's great to see. Those of you who have not, maybe this will help convince you you might consider a trip out there. And as Mike was saying, the Iowa Native Plant Society is uh, sponsoring a field trip there on July 2nd. I'll be leading that trip. Um, Tom, that's going to be the details will be on the INPS website, probably. Yep. All right. All right. Well, let's get started. So if you don't know where Tipton Prairie is, it is in Greene County, uh, right down here in the southeast corner of the county, this little red dot right there. Jefferson's right here in the middle. If you zoom in more on the southeastern portion of the county, it lies between Rippey and what's that town over there? Yeah. Cooper. Cooper? Is that really a town? <laughs> okay. There's a house there too. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's located right here in this yellow uh, spot right there. So it's just on the um, west side of the river there. I'm going to zoom in now on this area right here where it's located. And here's the prairie right here. It's uh, again owned by Green County Conservation. I talked to Don, Dan Towers a little bit yesterday. I wanted to get a little bit of history on it. I didn't really know too much myself. And he said he thought that it was acquired roughly about 2007 or so. But he and Jim Netwig had been doing management on it um, for at least 25 years. So it was acquired about 15 years ago, but they they knew about it and through a relationship with the landowner, the McDowell fam family, uh, they had allowed them to, yeah, go ahead and do whatever you want to. So uh, he's been managing it for about 25 years. He said that pretty much doing a burn every single year. So to get there, you have to come in up here. This is where we often meet when we do field trips. Here's the access point right here. It is a little bit more difficult to get to, especially if it's muddy or something. Normally we would drive down the lane right here and then drive around this field here. You can kind of see a lane right there. This is in um, Prairie Restoration right here. And then get over here and that's where we would park if it again is able to drive out here and then walk through a little bit of a, a small woodland area across the stream and come out into the prairie there at the north end. And that's what you would see looking to the south. It is a small site, about uh, 2.8 acres or so. Here's a topographic map that shows that the highest point is right up here, about 1,025 feet or so. Lowest point, again, coming in at the north end is down here, about a 45 um, feet gain in elevation when you hike up to the top. The soils at Tipton are mainly just two types, the Esterville Sandy Loam, which is pretty much the Western half or a little bit more than half, the Wadena Loam uh, over here on the east side. A little bit of the very east side is this Terra Loam. The Esterville and, uh, well, the Esterville in, in particular, both of these soils are formed from glacial outwash. Uh, but this one here, the Esterville is especially uh, got more coarse material. As you can see, it's a sandy loam. Uh, it's got more gravel and more sand in it uh, versus the Wadena. Well, here's just a picture of it. Again, looking at the uh, natural color aerial photo of 2019. Again, uh, this shows, you know, there's a quite a, there's a fair amount of woody vegetation that's surrounding it there. But if you jump back in time, you know, we can do that with the use of aerial photography from 1930. That's what it looked like back then. A lot less woody, woody growth along the, um, the, the sides there. And you can see in this photograph that indeed, well, maybe you can't, but someone who's looked at these photographs enough, you can see that 
Uh, this area over here looks like it's been tilled. This area looks like it's been tilled, but this just has that grayish color that suggests that it has not been tilled and that there is some type of uh, perennial herbaceous growth there. It's a little bit hard to say for sure if it's a prairie, but we know that it's uh, probably at least some, kind of, some type of grass. And as it turns out, Dan said that the, the McDowell family who owned it, and um, I think probably what happened is they owned this block of land right in here, and the stream here prevented access to this part of their land. And so it was never, they were never really able to turn it into row, row crop land. Plus it is a pretty steep hill. So they probably used it maybe as pasture. Eventually they started renting it to the um, Tipton family, which is the source of the name, the Tipton family, uh, some farmers who lived nearby, I presume, and they used it for prairie hay. So they started haying it probably uh, late summer, like most prairie hay would be done. He said that, you know, that probably goes back quite a while. He said that when he started at the County Conservation Board in 1985, that haying practice had, had stopped. So it hasn't been hayed for a long time, but he started doing the burning about probably about uh, 1997 or so. Here it is on um, a GLO. This is a government land office uh, map that shows what the land surveyors reported. They were required to make notes on the native landscape and, and provide a, a way of then sort of mapping what the native landscape looked like when they were doing the land surveying in Iowa, which mm -hmm. will happen mainly between 1832 and 1859. Mm -hmm. This tan color is prairie. This uh, green color here is what they call timber presumably some type of forest or woodland, yellow color are some small fields. So clearly uh, they reported it being in prairie and the, the two soils that are there, the Waldina and the Estervale are also soils that formed in tall, tall grass prairie. So it's, it's clear that prairie was here. So what were my goals here? As Mike mentioned, this was funded by uh, Raccoon River watershed folks. So just doing a basic forensic survey, I want to talk about this just a bit. There had been some plant inventories being done there starting way back in 2009. Uh, someone started keeping track of species on a spreadsheet, which eventually got in, in my hands. Lloyd Cram, Eileen Miller, and Rosalia Johnson, who's here. Rosalia, raise your hand mm -hmm. there. Uh, started just making some plant lists on their own. They had at least three survey dates in 2009. Lloyd reported 91 species or so in that spreadsheet as of that work during 2009. He reported this uh, number roughly in 2010. I started leading field trips there in 2010. And I would try to add to that list, of course. Um, a lot of times um, when I'm doing a field trip, that's really not a good time to try to really do an inventory of plants because what I'm doing mainly is talking to people and explaining the plants and talking to people about what we're seeing, not spending that much time looking for plants. So there were some plants added, of course. These two that are in blue were two dates where I specifically tried to do a little bit more of a survey and try to add a few more plants, which of course I did. All of that time from 2010 to 2019, I added, um, enough new species uh, to get 41 new species. We got up to 112 species basically, but and 41 of those were new species that weren't on the list that, that Lloyd and Eileen and Rosalia had done. Now also <laughs> my list were missing 20 species that their list had. So again, uh, it did, depends upon the time that you're out there, what you're gonna see of course. And again, because I was often not really looking for plants, trying to, teach people about plants, um, probably were missing some of those species. So in 2020, when this project started, we could say that the prairie at that time had the species list that was known to have about 130 total species and almost all of them native. Now for less than three acre prairie, 2.8, that's a pretty good number, 130 species on a pretty small prairie. So what I did was, of course, let me, let me back up real quick because I didn't talk about these things. So the first in inventory was, again, just to get a better list for the entire site. But I also wanted to 
get a measure or a handle on how much variation was occurring on the site. And then set up quantitative plots to help do that and provide a way to compare the species composition of Tipton Prairie with other data that I had that I had collected in those kinds of quantitative plots. That simply means a quantitative plot is where you're going to really get down to the nitty gritty, you're on your hands and knees, putting a quadrat out there, and you're really looking intensely for what you're going to see. Then I'm going to try to talk about how, how this prairie looks, vegetation assessment, in a couple of different ways. You want to get an idea of its quality. So the floristic quality index is something I'm going to use that uses the idea of conservatism in plants. I have my own system of sort of rating the prairie quality. And then there's, it's always important, of course, to look for imperiled species. These are species that are on the list of threatened or endangered species. And then we also, although I didn't do it, the study uh, was able to look at the, the two soils there. I um, had worked with Dan Polita, who's an NRCS soil scientist, and he uh, agreed to come over and uh, look at a profile and describe what the soils are. Okay, if that's important in terms of the methods, the reason I have, so this is an entire prayer again, so you do wandering surveys basically to try and get an idea of what, what you're gonna find there. And of course, looking for everything you can find. And then I set up these stations, station one through 10, uh, to get a handle again, what kind of variation is there within the prairie? And what happens on these stations, these are about 10 meter diameter circles. I would just do uh, what's called a releve, which is just looking in this area and recording again the species that I'm seeing, and then sort of just giving them a subjective estimate of what their abundance is. In these purple plots, these were 20 by 20 meter quantitative plots. These are plots that are like this right here. These are the plots that I used to uh, do some research with the NRCS from 2014 to 2018. Over that time period, uh, I and my colleagues that were working with me inventoried probably 160 of these plots. These, this was for the ecological site program the NRCS had, which was their way of trying to get an idea of what the native vegetation is for as many of the soils in Iowa as we could. And by going to the most pristine and remnant sites, uh, do one of these plots, this plot design was, that, that was their, their design, not mine. The NRCS came up with this 20 by 20 meter plot, had nine quadrats, uh, 40 by 40 cent centimeters in size, where I would, we would measure the cover of the plants, how much aerial cover there was, uh, we would cut the biomass out of those plots and take it back to the lab and sort it and weigh it to get a very quantitative measurement of how much uh, each species was. And then by looking collectively at all of these, you can get a measurement of the frequency, how often a species is seen. If you see a species in just two out of these nine, then two out of nine, that percentage is what the frequency is. So I've done a lot of these on a lot of sites all across Iowa probably at least um, 60 or 70 on prairies. So I wanted to set up one of these at Tipton so I could compare in a very, very uh, objective, quantitative way, the quality of Tipton Prairie with other sites in the uh, Raccoon River wa watershed. This is just a quick picture of uh, biomass, uh, using biomass to measure the abundance of a species. Very time consuming, very difficult. Not many people do it. Not many people want to do it because <laughs> what you do is you, you cut that sample and you take it back and you have to look at every single stem and put it into a pile that corresponds to the correct species. And you've got plants that are ranging from just barely vegetative, they're just coming up to, as you can see, I don't see any flowers there. So you're identifying everything based on what I call my gestalt which is, I know these plants because they're my friends. And I can recognize them because I can recognize many of you. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> there's one of the field trips um, out there. The study was done over 2020 and 2021, two years. We were originally, we we're gonna just do it in 2020, but what happened in 2020, of course, was that there was a really bad drought out in Guthrie County and, and Green County. And so it got to July and things were really looking pretty bad. And I, I think I talked to Mike or somebody and said, that, you know, this is not a good time to be doing this because the plants are not doing very well. 
I collected some other data. And the other reason that we had to add another year was uh, Dan was doing what I had suggested to him, which was to mow the sumac areas uh, in midsummer or so to really stress them. I guess I forgot to tell him that you don't do that this year though, because I'm doing a study out there. So he ended up mowing about half of the prairie and then I, you can't do anything then. <laughs> so 20, 2020 and 21, we're both using that. It turns out that's a better way to do it. Now I'm gonna use this idea of plant conservatism uh, many of you may not be familiar with it. It's just, it's a way that plant ecologists give a, a number to a plant and on a scale of one to 10 is how we do it in Iowa. That represents basically again, where this plant is on this successful environment. Another way of thinking about it is plants that have decreasing numbers or down at this end of the scale, those are plants that have a really favorable response to us. We make habitat for them by making disturbances common ryegreed, common milkweed, they're going to have low scores. Plants that really require the best of the best types of ecosystems that we have left, highly natural pristine environments are laid up at the top end of the list. If you have a plant and it has a CC of three, a coefficient of conservatism of three, how I describe to people what that means is that there's a 30% chance that plant came from a highly natural, pristine place, 30% chance. I take the scale from one to 10, which is what Iowa has, and I even modify it more for my own use. I add a negative direction on there for the invasive species, because that's what they do. Their effect on the community is bad. Oops. <clears throat> There's a, there's a negative three for sure, right there, can of thistle. Uh, that's a common evening primrose, which has a coefficient of two. That's the cardinal flower, which has a current rating of six. And that's the shorty lady slipper, which is a 10. I also do something with prairie quality. So the coefficients look at all the plants. And again, if you're looking more specifically at a prairie, and I think there, it sort of is important to try to do the same thing, sort of, but just with prairie plants. And so I come up with my own system here of, of giving plants a, a, a prairie indicator species coefficient, I guess you would call it. I use a much smaller scale. But what it means is that these numbers then represent these four classes or five classes. That what it means to me is this species is either an excellent indicator that this is a remnant prairie or it's a sort of good one, or it's a fair one, or it's somewhat of an indicator, or it's not an indicator at all. And so I have all, all, all the plants in Iowa assigned to uh, one of those six possibilities. And so I, I use those numbers then to count how many uh, prairie indicator species did I see? Uh, what percentage of the total plants did I see? What percentage of them are one of these species right here, either a one, two, three, four, or five? These are all indicators of prairie, but they are, some are worse and some are better. I developed a prairie index score, which is kind of complicated. I'm going to try to explain it, but it, it brings several variables into play. And this, I made it so it's scaled to 100. So here are, uh, this is um, the wild four o'clock, which is a one. That's Hori Vervain, which is a two. This is uh, wild bergamot, which is a three. This is uh, Scribner's Panic Grass, which is a four, and this is Prairie Blazing Star, which is a five, if you want some examples. Hmm. All right, some results. So 55 new vascular plant species were observed. That's, a, that's quite a few, uh, and I attribute a lot of that, finding new plants to the fact that I was actually doing those 20 by 20 meter plots, getting down on my hands and knees, looking at quadrats, surveying that 20 by 20 meter plot very intensively because that's how you find things. As you're just wandering around looking for things, you know, you're not so apt to find some of those really small things. So 55 new vascular plant species. Now 24 of them are grassland and that's these species right here, scientific and common names. So these are getting species that were not on that list, that checklist that we had developed over those years at the beginning of the project, which had 130. Four, or 15 of them were along the edge. Now, I think one reason that these species came on the list, of course, because previous you know, surveys out there are just, you know, in general, walking around looking for plants, 
really focused on the prairie and didn't look at that edge. But I, I included that edge. And then unfortunately there were 16 non-native species, lots, lots of them along that edge. So here's what it was before the project started. Remember 130 uh, total species, 126 and four. The coefficient of conservatism I just talked to you about, back, in, back before the study, there were 10 that had a CC of eight or higher, way up on that top, top scale, 26, seven or higher. So we're dropping down one more level. Now we have 172 native species, 16 more non-native for a total of 192. And look how much the really important plants increased. 10, we added 22 high conservative plant species that weren't known to be there. Added um, 29 or so uh, plants that have at least a CC of seven. I think this is one of the most important results that you don't really know what you got. Even by trying to do this sort of a, a survey of sorts, just wandering around, you really don't know what you got until you really do an intensive job. And this is really important. That elevates the quality of this prairie tremendously. Some other results. So these three up here are on the imperiled species list, the threatened and endangered species list. Uh, Dicantinum lineifolium, one of the plant grasses. I have, I have a question out there because I found that in one of the, the uh, 20 by 20 meter plot in a quadrat. But it was, again, that, that plot was surveyed in 2020 and it was very dry. And it looks like it probably is to me, but I couldn't say for sure because it was sort of in a depauperate condition because of the, the drought. So I'm not sure. It'd be good to try to verify that, of course. Uh, Soteria parviflora, this is the only native foxtail that we have in the state, bristly foxtail. It's an endangered species. Uh, and Spigmanthes manicoporum, that's the great plains lady tresses. That's a special concern right now. Uh, these two are for sure. It was interesting because. There's, if that one holds out to be true, then there's five different species of dicanthelium there, the panic grasses, um, ovale, wilcoxianum, libergii, and, lig and oligosanthes. This one is the one that you mostly see on, on prairies. So it's a dicanthelium rich prairie. Uh, some other interesting results. These three species, I would say, you know, are, are really um, interesting and important that, that we, that, that Tipton prairie stays uh, well managed and cared for because these all represent species that are really adapted to dry soils. And so the dotted blazing star is mainly a Western Iowa species, really a Lost Hill species. It's mainly only found in the Lost Hills. There are some gravel prairies, other places you can find it. Tipton Prairie is one of the easternmost sites that you can find it. Hairy Grandma is a, it's really a short grass prairie species. It would be a dominant grass out in Eastern Colorado. And it, again, it occurs in places throughout Iowa, but only in very special environments. They have to be really dry. They have to be gravelly soils, uh, uh, south-facing, uh, thin soils, uh, hill prairies. You see a lot up in this part of Iowa because that's getting closer to the Great Plains and that's where it does, does better. And then prairie turnip. So again, Tipton Prairie provides the habitat for species you typically don't find on a prairie in Green, Green County. Uh, I won't spend much time talking about this because I uh, don't have time, but this is the, uh, the sheets that I got from Dan. So this in the report that I sent to uh, Mike, I'll talk more about the, uh, the soils and what, what this means. I will point out, this is the one that's the Esterville one. And he made a note down here, it couldn't go deeper than 110 centimeters, too many large rocks. <laughs> no doubt, um, some glacial erratics probably buried there. <clears throat> All right, then some other results. The results of the, the within the prairie kind of um, goals that I had, how much variation within the prairie. So each of these stations, I got, again, I got a measurement of frequency, which is a number just again, based from zero to one, 100. How frequent is the species in these 10 meter diameter circles? The first one up here is Echinacea pallida, pale purple coneflower, and these are the numbers. None up there, 70% there, 25, 35, not much over here. Um, pretty good up here. This, this is the really driest part right in through here, 45% up there. 
This is a really, um, not really even hardly a prairie down here. This has got a lot of shrub growth in, in it. And then in the two um, ecological site plots, 78 and 33, so you can see um, it occurs pretty good over most of the prairie. It's, it's definitely not gonna be in parts of the prairie where uh, you've had a lot of invasive species where, and especially where you've got uh, shrubs and cool season grass. So I, I, if I wanted to, I had time, I could make a whole bunch of these little maps that show essentially the distribution of many plant species. I'll just show you a few more. Uh, there's bastard toad flax. It was pretty much everywhere. See, it is in every single sample. Up as high as 80% right there. Some of them down to 5%. It doesn't like real dry soils real well. It's down to 15% right there. Here is um, butterfly milkweed, much more sporadic. Uh, occurs through here, occurs some over here on this west facing slope. Those are the only two main places you're gonna see it there. Here's um, sky blue aster. So again, this is a way of just kind of providing a, a more detailed look at how each species sort of behaves where it's, where it's doing the best, where it's doing the worst. And here's sumac. Sumac, interestingly, only really occurs on the eastern half. You can kind of see that rough texture in through here. That kind of helps point it out. But all of these numbers here are really just, you know, pretty much a dividing line right, right there. And it's not that bad. That's a picture I, I got off of web. Uh, and what Dan has been doing there with the burning and the summer mowing has helped. All right, now some of the FQI. The FQI is a floristic quality index. Again, it comes from the coefficients of conservatism. Um, an index of about 25 to 30 is usually considered to be pretty good and probably is characterizing a pretty decent plant community. I calculated for each of the stations and also for the two ecological site plots. 44 is about the highest I've ever seen on anything I've ever done. And so that's the native FQI looking at just the native species. Then I do another FQI that uses all of the species, native and non-native. I weight the index according to the abundance of the species, what its frequency is. If you see that there's not much difference between the two, then that means there's not too much of an effect of non-native species because the difference between these, this one has native and non-native in it. Remember the non-native ones have a negative coefficient. So their effect would to bring the score down. If it doesn't come down very much, then there's not too much of a, what I call a, a negative effect of the non-native species. And that's what we're seeing here. Both of them 44 here, both of them 40 here. Native, the non-native species are not having a very um, negative effect here. Here's the prairie quality index. Remember, it's scaled to a value of 100. Uh, the bottom number is, the top number is just the number of prairie species, prairie indicator species. And you can see, again, um, this one is definitely worse uh, because the prairie index is only 39. So that's you know, barely a prairie there, really. These two, again, are, are the worst places. We have a perfect 100 score right there. And we have some 98s. We have a 96 and an 85 in the two bigger plots. Uh, those are really good scores. Now, the last thing I want to do, um, pretty much on time here, is so just looking at what I've looked at so far, it says, ah, Tipton Prairie is pretty good. And I knew that the first time I walked out there and looked at it. Subjectively, I knew, oh, this is, this is a really good prairie. What I've showed you, hopefully, is quantitative data that confirms that. But how does it compare to other prairies? So I looked at two other sites. Here's Tipton up here again. Looked at Sheeter Prairie, which is a state preserve. It was believed to be a good enough quality at one time to be dedicated as a state preserve, which is supposed to be the highest recognition the state of Iowa can give to a piece of land. And it's supposed to give it more protection too, but the governor can always say no. <laughs> um, and then Tool Prairie. And Tool Prairie is owned by John Judson over by White Rock. Oh. Uh, Tool Prairie is seven acres in size. Cedar Prairie is 25 acres in size. Tipton is 2.8. So Tipton is by far the smallest. And usually again, there's more potential for a prairie to score higher on these values I'm gonna show you here, the larger it is. 
So here's a quick uh, list. So here's our, our two Tipton ones. This is the Esterville um, plot. This is the Waldina plot. And then here we had, again, why I'm using these is because I did these ecological site plots at these two sites. So we're, all of these are numbers that come from that 20 by 20 meter plot, all done the same way. The methods are exactly the same. And just looking at native richness, Tipton sites win, except for Sheeter right there, which has 49. But non-native richness, Tipton wins with only one each in each of the two plots. Sheeter had at least had, had five. So when you combine both of those, uh, again, uh, Tipton's going to win. The hmm. average mean coefficient of conservatism is over six here. Again, that beats the two here. Native FQI, 44, we saw that on the previous one, 44 and 40, beats those. The weighted all species FQI, which factors in non-native species again, wow. again, still beats those two. Prairie richness, um, 47 here at Cedar, so it's a little bit higher, but uh, Tool Prairie is less. Percent prairie richness, this is an important one. What percentage of the total number of species are prairie indicator species? 93 and 95, again, beats these two numbers. The prairie index, that, uh, again, ranked to a score of 100, um, is higher than these two. And then this is just the last measure here, it tells you how much productivity the site had. This is the above ground annual net primary production. It's the amount of dry biomass that you're getting per square meter. Pretty similar uh, across all of these. Uh, the Waldina one, which is lower on the slope, you know, it's way down lower on that east facing slope, uh, a little bit more productivity there. So that's it. This is uh, Tool Prairie. This is Sheeter Prairie. I think this shows us that Tipton Prairie uh, is better or just as good, certainly, in terms of its floristic quality than a state preserve right here and a pretty well managed prairie over here that's privately owned. So come out to Tipton Prairie on the um, 2nd of July if you want to uh, learn more about prairie. And better yet, if you have someone or know someone who's never seen a prairie, bring them along. Because as we've been talking about, the only way we can really make progress, I think, in terms of everything we need to see happen, and uh, all the previous speakers you know, talked about what needs to happen in Iowa. Neil gave us a good list of what needs to happen. I don't think any of that's going to happen until we have a lot of people that care about the environment. A lot of people need to get out and experience the environment and see a prairie, see a woodland, see a forest, see a clean stream. That's how you get them to care about something. And that's how then you get them to vote, which is what has to happen. So here's uh, Bicno Sedge. Oops, sorry. Bicno Sedge. That is uh, a Western species of grass, uh, Western muley grass, which again, really occurs mainly on really dry sites. There's the uh, favorite uh, of field trips, the uh, wood lily. We know exactly where that plant is. <laughs> There's a dodder, which is a parasitic plant, prairie dodder. Here's uh, a really important plant called prairie drop seed, which uh, occurs in good abundance out there. There's that sky blue aster. There's white prairie clover. There's uh, Western evening primrose. There's um, ground plum, fair amount of that up on top of that hill in that dry soil and a uh, downy gentian. All right, thank you Raccoon River Watershed for the money to make this project work. We have more money. Wow, we knew it was good, didn't we? We didn't know it was that good. Wow. Dan Towers really deserves a lot of credit for, for that. You know, Dan worked for the county and he had all kinds of 